afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Marquee Show Lounge. Now, at 28 years old, with 150 properties in his portfolio worth $20 million, he makes $2 million alone in rent per year, which makes him the Donald Trump of Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with you never forget your first million dollars, please put your hands together for Nathan Birch. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules before I start. Uh, obviously, no advice is given here today, so I'll talk about things candidly as I see it. I'm not normally a speaker. I talk about things as I see it. I wear my thongs. I'm not here in a suit to try and impress anyone. Uh, just like to take a and sharing a few things about what I've learned along the way and what's been able to make me be able to tell my boss to fuck off. Uh, and excuse my swearing with that as well. I tend to let out a few words. Um, with it, just a bit on what I'll be covering off on today. Um, just looking at who I am, where it all started, did I have a silver spoon in my mouth as a child, all that sort of stuff. Investment strategies that I've adopted over the years to be able to build my property portfolio. Um, some case studies of other people that actually do it. Uh, property fundamentals how to get started and some questions and answers at the end. So if it's okay to get going, I'll start it on. A little bit about how I got into property investing. I was having a chat with Gemma about it beforehand. Um, I came from a blue collar working family uh, in Western Sydney. Everyone was working, all that sort of stuff. And I was 13 years old, it was a surprise package. My parents had me when they were nearly 50. And my brothers were older and I wanted to be like them. Uh, my brothers, a couple of my brothers bought houses when I was like 13 years old and I started picking up the Homes Pictorial magazine, if you remember what they were, they don't exist nowadays really. Um, I looked at them like other boys my age would look at other magazines, but you know, the pages didn't stick together in the property mags. <laughs> it was pretty exciting for me. but. Um, I saved up, I worked as a child, I got my first real job at the age of 17. Uh, by the age of 18 I had 35 grand in my first cool car that I'd bought, which was a brand new car. Um, I'd worked between the age of 13 to 18 uh, in order to be able to buy a house. Uh, my first house was in Mount Druid of Western Sydney. I don't know who here's from Sydney. Yeah, from Sydney, okay. So Mount Druid, it's humble beginnings, it's not, you know, having anything really to, you know, people were telling me you shouldn't be buying that, you're going to go broke, you can't make money in Mount Druid. Um, I'll show you how I made money and I've actually sold that house and made like 250 grand on it since, um, you know, buying it. Bought my first property in 18, in 2003, makes me 28 years old, turning 29 now. I made my first million bucks at the age of 21 in Mount Druid, well, in and around that western suburbs area, in Blacktown and Penrith Council. Uh, left the workforce at the age of 24. I was working two full-time jobs for a period of, you know, up to that point, uh, in order to save deposits, be able to put that money into my next property. Nowadays, I have a freedom of choice. I like wearing thongs. People say I look better in suit and stuff, but I think thongs are pretty funky and it's my choice of footwear and just have fun doing things on my terms, how I like it. Currently, um, I have over 150 properties. Whilst my property portfolio started in western suburbs, I still have the fundamentals of buying the same sort of properties as what I bought then. Today, I'm just going to make sure I don't fall off stage here. Um, and I'll show a few examples about what I've bought over the years and how those properties have helped me to get me to where I am today. Currently, my position is about $2 million per year in rents. My property portfolios over the $20 million mark now. Um, my LVR, if you look at loan to value ratio, just on the property portfolio, it's less than 50%. So people might say, I oh, you know he's got lots of debt or anything like that. I don't have much debt in consideration. Um, there's no rocket science. Does anyone here have children or had children just finish school or got children about my age here? Yeah. You'd want them to go to school, get good grades, become a doctor or whatever. Um, here's my UAI, uh, 32.8. I don't think this thing's got a pointer on it, but 32.8, there's no rocket science to what I was doing. Uh, it's just a matter of having, driving a passion and a vision of being able to achieve what you want. So um, today, um, when I left my job at 24, uh, the reason why I'm here talking, um, and as a bit of a profile in the media is that when I left my job, I got bored. Uh, people think 
retired, all that sort of stuff. It's pretty cool. I had nothing to do, or mates were working. I had I was going insane. Um, I used to have to conform to society, wear a suit, all that sort of stuff, try and make bosses happy. And the day I quit my job, I was, went home, woke up on Monday morning thinking, shit, what am I going to do? Um, I had a passive income stream at that point, about 30,000. Uh, within the 12 months succeeding that, I had 80,000 passive income. It wasn't an active income by doing anything, it was just collecting rents. Um, so that was after all expenses and everything like that. Um, I got to a point where I started making YouTube videos. Uh, I'll put up a link to YouTube later if you want to go watch some more stuff. I just say stuff as it is along the way um, as of what I'm doing so people can learn from that. No bullshit. You know? um, from that point, I started setting up some companies now. I, I have over 40 companies. Uh, they range from law firm uh, to real estate offices to an uh, advisory firm for investment properties. Um, but also have computer programs, property management businesses, and the likes. But enough of that. This is where it all began. Uh, the picture on my computer looks a bit better than the picture up there because it's blurry from the light. But um, purchase price was 248000 This was in 2003. It was a house made in a dual occupancy property. This is in the suburb of Hebersham. I just sold it the other day after 10 years, 450 grand. Our rent on it was 600 bucks a week. The rental return was 12.8%. If we look at the numbers there, that property was putting in about 200 bucks a week in my pocket. It's 10 grand a year. You know, buys a few, few pina coladas every week and you know, have fun. But um, that's one of my first properties that I purchased. It was my first property I purchased. These are just some examples of other things that I bought. This thing was in Cairns, $90,000. Um, market value at the time of purchase was 120 grand. Rent on it at the time of purchase was $200 per week, 11.5% return. Uh, people say you can't get, you have to negative gear properties. Uh, I think there's nothing positive about negative gearing except for you losing money. And I don't think anyone would go to work on work for their boss to lose money or pay your boss to go to work. So why would you buy a property that's going to lose money? It doesn't make sense. Um, this property was below market value, upside for capital growth. These things were selling for about 200000 in a previous cycle. Um, big thing about me, and I'll get into it shortly, is I like to buy properties that are below market value, so I'm making money on the way in, not hoping and praying as I go on. This property here is in Penrith. It's a nice brick house. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it looks pretty black there on the screen of the picture. It's a lovely house with little rose gardens and stuff. Purchase price 232000 Market value 400,000, rent on it 390 per week. It's just a bread and butter property. I forgot to put the yield in there. I was making this uh, slide show up the other day and forgot to put that on, so sorry about that. Uh, this property here, this one's in Shelby in Western Sydney. I don't know if anyone from Western Sydney knows where Shelby is. Purchase price 205, market value 320, rent 360, nearly 10% return. That puts in I like someone to purchase a 205 rent for, two, for 360 and put about 100, 150 bucks a week in your pocket. These properties here, I bought them off a developer that went bust. So you see developers that have got glossy brochures, they come in suits, they try and sell properties to people. Um, I'd never touch one of those sort of properties. I like the properties where I can buy them where people are losing money on them. These things here were selling for about 500,000 uh, at one point. Pick them up for two hundred and twelve thousand one hundred. Uh, market value on them at the time was about three twenty thousand. Uh, rent on them three forty per week. These are modern units, needed no work. Um, on the central coast, of New South Wales at the entrance. Pinnacle Gardens once again. Um, nowadays, I buy different sort of properties. Um, this here is just a, a motel that I bought in Newcastle, uh, in Sydney. Um, Purchase price 650. I settled on it about a month ago. Market about 1.2 mil. Uh, rent three and a half grand a week. Rental yield on that's about 20%. I forgot to put the yield into it once again. Here's a shop. Uh, if we look here on the right hand side, there's some development that's gone on. Uh, units on tops of shops and all that sort of stuff. I own a shop in the middle there. Uh, purchase price was last year 465. I rented it out to. I can't really talk about it, it's an anchor tenant for 20 years, it's an international company. Um, 
rented 80,000 plus GST and it goes up each year. Market value is 1.1 mil on that, half mil just for you know, making fun and making property deals happen. This one here I just settled on, uh, it's a, a motel block, a 1.665 mil. Uh, it's 36 units in the Blue Mountains, Western Sydney. Market values 5 mil, thereabouts. Um, rent on it 8 grand a week, it's 400 grand a year. I had to buy this thing cash, so 8 grand a week passive income is pretty cool. Um, a lot of people talk about where, where, where can you start, where can I start, how can I do this sort of stuff. Uh, for me, when I was um, 18 years old, I worked my first real job, full-time job, and I fucking hated it, uh, having to you know, wear a suit every day, this and this, what the boss tells me to do, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, for me, I knew that I wanted to build a, a, a property portfolio to get myself out of the workforce so I didn't have to do that for the next 40 years. Um, for you, it could be you know, being able to take the kids to school, have fun, do things on your terms in line with your goals. Um, most important thing, I always talk about having a roadmap to understand where you're going. It's a bit like you're in Sydney, you want to go to Gold Coast, where are you starting from? You need to understand where you are today, where you want to go, and work out a plan of attack to get there. So each one of my properties that I personally buy, um, I make sure that they're a key piece into where I want to go, and they're going to help each property is going to help me get there better and better each one. Understand what's happening in the market. A lot of people just buy properties for the sake of it. Someone tells them they should buy it, their accountant tries to sell them something, whatever the case may be. There's a lot of sharks out there, a lot of people trying to you know, sell you shit. Um, just be very careful and uh, be aware of spruikers and, and the like. Um, once you've got a plan of attack, going, okay, for me it was, if I'm 18 again, and I was buying my first property, I wanted to, when I first started buying property, I wanted to have 50 grand a year passive income, if you remember, at that point, going back 10 years ago, 50 grand was an average wage, uh, or a bit higher than average wage. Um, I thought to myself, if I could get 50 grand a year coming in every week, I wouldn't have to get out of bed, go to work, all that sort of stuff, pay for food, pay for jewels, pay for petrol, all that sort of stuff. Um, I need to work out how can I get basically a thousand bucks a week passive income coming in my bank account. Looking at the properties I was purchasing, I wasn't just buying properties for the sake of it, I was buying properties that were adding to the cause of helping me to get to where I want to get to. Um, a lot of people know what they've got to do, but forget to take action. It's important to take action. And a bit like McDonald's, McDonald's have got pretty crap hamburgers, but um, they have a system that's in place. And they have a hamburger that they sell, and it works, so they sell it over and over and over again get the result of doing what they do. Um, for me, having properties that are fundamental, uh, blue chip, bread and butter properties, they're gonna go up in value, bring a passive income, and create capital growth is what I was after. So once you've got something that works, just do it over and over again. Just looking at a bit of a, a breakdown, an example on building a property portfolio like what I'm talking of. Um, if you were to buy your first property for $200,000, um, you need, say, $50,000 to get into it. You can get into it with less capital by having a 5% uh, a deposit, 10% deposit, all that sort of stuff. But being able to extract equity, uh, I'm not going to go into talking about banks and finance and all that sort of stuff because it would be deemed as financial advice. However, having the capital there to, to start off with, if you have a 20% deposit, it's a lot easier to be able to extract equity to go again. And what do I mean by that? If you're using fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand of them would probably go to the government for steam duty, your solicitor for legal fees, all that sort of stuff. Forty grand would go in as a deposit, and an eighty to eighty percent loan of two hundred thousand is one hundred and sixty grand. You've got a property that's settled, and you go, okay, how can I get my next property? Because the reality is, if you can have ten properties that are worth two hundred thousand, go up to four hundred thousand, you're turning two million dollars into four million dollars. I'll get on to that in the next slide. If you were to start off with your $50,000 capital, purchase that property, settle it, 
every property that I purchase, there's three main rules that I want to make sure every single property has, and that is to buy a property that's below market value, have an upside for capital growth, and have a, a solid cash flow. When I mean a solid cash flow, I want it to look after itself, pay for council rates, water rates, mortgage, everything like that, and either have no, no negative expenses or put some money in your pocket each week. So if the property is worth 250000 and you pick it up for 200000 you've got $50,000 worth of inbuilt equity from day one. If you take that property back to the bank, and if we're looking at some of the examples of what I've shown previously, and I'll show you some more examples later on, uh, purchase property, 200000 take it back to the bank, get it revalued for 260000 I'm going to fall off the stage here. 80% um, of the $260,000 um, is a new loan of $208,000. Minus original loan of uh, $160,000, leaves you with $40,000, $48,000 equity. So basically you've got the majority of your capital back to go again to your second property and just repeat the process over and over again. Buy your second property, $200,000, $160,000, $40,000, 10000 property settled, release the equity, rebate, two sixty. Make sense? Cool. Yeah. Depends on the bank, depends on the, the, the lender. And so the question was is can you go back to the bank as soon as you settle the property and revalue the, the property and extract the equity? Um, it's all in buying the actual property. So making sure that you're buying a property that is below market value. Um, and you know, there's controversy. People will sit there and say, um, you can't buy a property that's below market value. Why would someone sell it for that? There's lots of reasons why properties do sell cheaper. Um, some of them I've purchased personally in a bank repossession sort of deal. Uh, nowadays, just from strength and buying capacity in the marketplace. So in one of my businesses, I actually have a, 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 a an investment firm where I'll purchase lots of properties and I can take out like blocks of units where the developers has gone bust and purchase them at pennies in the dollar. Um, other things of where a real estate agent might not appreciate the value of the property, they think it's like if we all sat here with a, a Ford Falcon on stage or a Holden Commodore, I'm not going to be a Holden or Ford fan, but if we have a car here and we ask everyone in the room what their thoughts of the value is, we'd all probably have a different opinion on what the car is worth. Um, and there's no real exact value of what someone would pay for it. But um, it's important to do your research. And if you're finding that you know, a Commodore selling for $15,000 and you pick something up to $10,000 and there's nothing there, it's in perfectly good order and the same as the comparables, it would be below market value. Um, banks generally don't understand that you can buy a property cheap. So there is a bit of understanding what the banks will look at when revaluing that property to extract equity. But, I've pulled out equity pre-GC, like probably a week after settling them. Um, in this current climate, I've seen people do it in six weeks, four weeks, three months. I'd normally generally say on a conservative side of things, between three to six months would be a fair, yeah, fair time. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, cool. Um, as far as investment strategies, I always look at um, understanding what you're getting yourself into is important. Um, you don't see any successful business, just you see a couple of them, but they're unsustainable. Set up, be lucky, because you can't you know, manufacture luck, it'll, it'll just run out straight away. Um, understanding and, and researching markets, understanding and researching what you're trying to do, and each deal that you're gonna purchase needs to make sense to you, like financial sense, that it's gonna help you get to where you wanna be, it's gonna put money in your pocket, and you've got a clear vision for it. If you're buying it just willy-nilly, you might make some money, you might not make some money. And um, I know a lot of people, when I purchase properties from them, they lose money on their properties. So it's important that, that you understand what you're buying. Um, I can tell you streets, and I'm from Western Sydney, I still live in Sydney, in the Hills District. Um, with it, I can tell you areas and streets in Gold Coast, in Brisbane, in Western Sydney, in Kempsey, Camworth, Orange, I can tell you street by street and tell you what I think property is worth because I spend so much time in the marketplace. Um, I don't expect everyone to you know, be that in depth into it, but have a good understanding of what's happening out there um, and do your own research on it. Um, strong yield. Does everyone know what yield is in 
here? Anyone doesn't know? Yeah. I'll explain what yield is. Um, yield is a, a return basically on your investment. So if you're buying a property for $200,000, people would normally say, like a sales group would say, $200,000, $200 a week rent is a good rent for you. The problem is, is that $200 per week times by 52 weeks in the year is $10,400 per year. Uh, the interest only repayment on 200,000 is normally over 5%, so you're only just covering the interest if you're lucky on that property. Personally, I want to see a property with an 8% yield plus um, on it to make sure that it's going to cover itself, have its own heart, lungs, respiratory system, so it doesn't need you to actually fund it each week. So, yeah. Um, want to make sure that a property has upside for future growth. Uh, there's no point buying in a, a one horse town uh, that's going to go backwards or stay stagnant or never go up in value because it just doesn't make sense to buy something and hold a property for all the stress level and all that sort of stuff for no reason. Um, opportunities there to manufacture growth. So for me in the early days, um, I started my first job. Um, I thought real estate agents earn lots of money. So I was 17 years old. I put signs up for a real estate office and I saw everything around me. I thought, she, I don't know if it's, is there any real estate agents in here? That's good. Um, it's the shittest job that I could imagine in the world. Um, they under a lot of stress, they don't pay that much, um, and they have a very stressful life. So that was only a short term gig of you know, six months, 12 months. And um, yeah, I, I wasn't working on a big income. My income level was over six figures when I was working between the age of 18 or 17 to the age of 24. Um, I used to work two full-time jobs. I worked for various jobs in sales jobs, um, in pubs and clubs and stuff like that. Always worked two full-time jobs. I was working 80-hour weeks, 100-hour weeks. Uh, one year I remember I had less than seven days off in the whole entire year, working 20-hour days quite common. Um, for me, I didn't have a big chunk of cash, a lot of capital to sit there to start off with. I had to manufacture that. Uh, how can I manufacture growth? I targeted a lot of properties that needed renovations and built sweat equity. Uh, once again, I'm no builder, but I did what I could to try and build sweat equity in the properties to create more equity to go again. Um, it's important to have a foundation portfolio in my point of view. Um, a lot of people, oh, I answer what a foundation portfolio is. A lot of people go to a seminar and listen to someone talk about they can develop a property or they should buy land or a house or whatever the case may be. Um, for me, personally, um, I think it's important for everyone to build a solid asset base and that's had by having good quality, when I say good quality, blue chip properties, they may not be in ball clues, you know, units that are worth over a million bucks or whatever. I mean properties that are going to go up consistently, low entry price, easy to dispose of as an exit strategy, have a strong rental return, it's going to be putting pop money in your pocket each week. Um, I feel like I'm drunk on the stage here, sorry about that guys. It's, uh, the boat's moving. Um, with it, having at least 10, 12, 15, 20 of those sort of properties that are just bread and butter properties, they could be something in, well, most people are from Sydney, the western suburbs of Sydney, if you're from Brisbane, south, south, southeast areas, whether it be the back of the Gold Coast, south of Brisbane, Logan, those sort of areas, uh, Adelaide, areas like um, Elizabeth and around those sort of areas, more the blue collar working areas, they're good solid foundation properties, um, even properties on the central coast here in New South Wales are good as well. Um, the reason being is a lot of people will sit here and say, I'd rather buy something like those block of units that Nathan was talking about beforehand for 650 or 1.6 mil or whatever the case may be. If I was in a position where I had to sell those things, they're not going to sell in a week's time. If I need to dispose of the asset, it's going to be a lot more riskier. If I go to the bank, they're not going to give me an 80% lend on They're going to want 50% lend and a bigger deposit onto it. Um, the importance of having foundation portfolio I was working two jobs trying to get the highest income that I could get. If I couldn't do that anymore, I had to go and work at Macca's and you know, get 20 grand a year that'll pay for petrol, food, that sort of stuff. 
or property portfolio of 10, 20 properties will sit there, go up in value, do its thing, and look after itself. Um, if we were to have 10 properties that are worth 200 grand in a foundation portfolio, go from 200 grand to 400 grand, that's turning $2 million into $4 million. If you think about an average wage of 50 grand a year, times it by 20 years, that's a million bucks. You can go to work for 20 years for a million bucks. You can just buy 10 properties, five properties, let them go up in value, sell them, do whatever you want with it. I'm not a big fan of selling properties because if you've got something that's working for you, just multiply what you're doing and increase your result. So um, having the foundation portfolio gives you opportunities for me to be able to go and buy blocks of units, pull out big chunks of cash, talk about big chunks of cash. I wouldn't be able to do it without having a foundation portfolio in place, which consisted of 20, 30 properties, Western Sydney, Central Coast, um, some regional areas as well. I never used to go and buy blocks of units, motels, shopping centres, stuff like that in the early days. Um, the last thing is on this one, uh, passive versus active income. Uh, I would be keen of passive income, not active income. A lot of people think from being a property investor, you go buy a property, subdivide it, develop on it, sell it, make some profit, go to another one. The problem is, is that if I sat here and said, I bought my first house, renovated it, sold it, made a couple of bucks, bought another one, renovated it, sold it, made a couple of bucks, I'll be sitting here today saying I've got five properties, I've made a good wage over the last 10 years, and the asset position isn't as strong. Um, personally, I'm all about delayed gratification, um, always wanted sports cars, always wanted cool fancy things. It's only nowadays that I do it and have those cool things because I've sacrificed a lot of sacrifice for youth, I've sacrificed lots of things. Didn't have to be that way but I went to the extreme. I know lots of people that have built active, been active with building their portfolios for two years, three years. They've got 15, 20, 30 properties, uh, bring themselves in a cash flow position so they can leave the workforce and tell their boss where to go. Um, so that's the difference between passive and active. Um, basically, I've got a slide on it here. If we were to have the 200,000 purchase price, 400 grand a day in 10 years, it could be in two years, it could be in three years, it could be in five years. I can't predict a boom. Um, one thing that I do say is that Sydney's going through a boom at the moment, New South Wales is going through a boom, Queensland's going through a boom. The biggest market this year I reckon will be Queensland. Um, if you were to rent it out for 300 bucks a week, one thing that we haven't covered off on, if that property is neutral cash flow today, buying it for 200 grand, renting it for 300 bucks a week, um, sometimes people will challenge me and say you can't find those properties, Nathan, they're not around there. They're out there every day of the week I find those properties. Um, if you were to hold that property for five years, your rent would not be $300 a week in five years. It'll be more like $350, $400. So the property's cash flow neutral from day one. In year five, it's most likely $100 a week positive cash flow. You've got 10 of them. There's 10 properties at 100 bucks a week positive cash flow. There's a grand a week. Buys some pina coladas. Um, everyone follow that one? These are just some properties recently that I've acquired um, in my investment agency for other clients and myself. Whenever I buy bulk sort of properties, I always buying them myself. Uh, this thing here, Central Coast, um, asking price 600 grand. They were selling for a lot more than that previously, 700,000, stuff like that. Pick them up for 435, equity on them, 165 grand, that's just being conservative. Uh, rent on them, 980 bucks a week. They could rent out for more money than that, but I just leave them full-term occupancy, positive cash flow, low market value. They, they, that deal just went through this month. This property went through last week, and this is in Brisbane. Uh, made at 210,000, it's a two bedroom townhouse, 20 minutes from Brisbane. Um, the purchase price we paid was 172,000. 32 grand below market value, giving the opportunity to go back and extract some equity, redeploy to other properties. Current rent on at 250 per week, wipes its own nose, just a bread and butter foundation sort of property uh, that we're looking at there. Um, this property here, sometimes people say, 
What, what, what do you think the cheapest property that I've ever bought would be? A lot of people know me here, do they? Eight grand's exactly it, yeah. Um, actually, I bought a block of land for a thousand bucks once, and I sold for 20, and the solicitor's fees cost me more than the purchase price of the block of land. <laughs> um, this one here is a regional New South Wales property. Purchase price, 100, uh, asking price 120, purchase price 90,000, 92,000. I rent for 160 per week. I reckon the rent on that should be about 180 per week. It's going to be a 10% yield at that point. But, you know, sometimes it's important to have a good property manager that can walk up the rents for you and, and get the better return. Um, this one here, it's a bit weird what you're seeing there um, from my screen. I took that photo off a balcony of a penthouse that I bought on the Gold Coast recently. Um, people were buying them out of the glossy brochures off the developer and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's from the balcony to the pool. Um, for 500, 600, 700,000. Um, I dealt directly with the bank on this deal. The bank's in America. I can't disclose the name of the bank, but it's a big bank. Um, purchase price that I paid was average price rent of 320,000. These properties had valuations by Heron Hollis White, which is a very conservative valuation firm, um, at the asking prices when I purchased them. That was ordered by the bank. Um, I settled on these just on before Christmas on the 21st of December. I had all of them settled at once, 788 units to block. Um, I got the remaining stock in the development fast as um, there was 25 that I had. I should have paid about 80 of them, but they decided to sell them full price for something. That's not the best picture as well, but it's a pimp building. Um, it's in the CBD of um, Southport, it's actually called Southport Central Towers, it's a pretty cool property. Is there any questions at this point? Or? Sorry? Good question. So the question was how do I get them so cheap? Um, a lot of networking comes in to it now, and um, time in the market, like, the, the, the cheap properties that yeah, so I showed you beforehand, um, to go back to my slides. Yeah. I wouldn't be buying in Western Sydney today. Uh, it's good, good question. Western Sydney, I'm assuming that you're actively trying to purchase something at the moment, yeah? Um, what I'm finding at the moment is in Western Sydney, properties are selling as soon as they hit the market. Before they hit the market as well, for more than the asking price, how can you get them cheap? I'm not buying them. Like, I, I used to purchase probably 20 properties, 30 properties in Western Sydney a week, about a month of my clients. And um, nowadays, out there, I might buy five a month if I'm lucky. And that's just from the agents calling me and me jumping on it straight away. Uh, being very active because I can see the market's moving. Um, personally, I think that the market's got about another 50 grand in it to be had. So, well, what areas are you looking at? Oh, Rouse Hill, okay. Yeah, it's a bit more expensive over there again. Um, when I was saying Western Sydney, I was looking more towards like the Penrith, Blacktown, those sort of areas. I just bought out there um, recently as well, um, and the market has. Um, taken off quite a bit. Um, is it for a principal place residence for you to live or? Okay. I wouldn't buy there for investment personally, um, just because I think that, and I, I will make this as a bit of a educational discussion as we're getting off the slideshows. Um, what's the average price in Roundsville, do you reckon? Six, let's say 600 to 700,000 for a house on land in Rouse Hill, Western Sydney. Um, the, the question that we're going to ask ourselves, if you don't know where that is, that's bread and butter, mum and dad, McMansion sort of area. Uh, they're nice new homes in the States, all that sort of stuff. The question that I ask myself is how much further can that property go up in value? Because, yeah, 
I don't see that in 10 years' time it could go from 600,000 to 1.2 or 700,000 to 1.4 because that's where mum and dads live. You know, to be able to pay the mortgage and that sort of stuff, it's a lot more than what the, the salary is and a lot more than what I reckon they could go up by. So, personally, I stick to areas that are, that are going to clean up a fair bit. Um, if we look at all throughout Sydney, whether we go from like Bankstown, Punch Bowl, those sort of areas that have cleaned up a lot over the last few years, units I can pick up four years ago, five years ago, for 160 grand, now you can't buy them under 320, so it's sort of doubled in five years. Um, I think like areas like Mount Druitt, Penrith, Campbelltown, those areas are going through a big social cleanse at the moment, and, and the prices have been pulled back so long, so much, that they're going to increase. Um, to find a two bedroom unit in an area for 400,000, it's not that expensive, but to find a property for 1.2 or 1.4 is going to exceed, yeah. Um, so I wouldn't consider that personally as a, a wise investment, but yeah, it's something, the market is hot, um, it will be a lot harder to get bargains. Um, I like personally buying areas, if we take the emotion out of any deal when buying a property, um, I look at it as a business transaction buying a property, uh, the property is just the asset, we do happen to live at home, so that's why the emotion sometimes gets involved with it. But um, you wouldn't be buying a property or a business that's going to lose you money or not have any upside for growth and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you're, if you were to buy shares, I don't know if anyone, does anyone buy shares in here? Yeah? Would anyone have Woolworths shares? Yeah? Would you go to Woolworths and inspect every single Woolworths site? Or would you care that they've got lots more Woolworths stores in Perth and what they've got in Sydney or whatever? You look at the numbers and the return that the business is going to generate for you to be able to make an educated decision to purchase it. Um, and that's what I look at with property. So if, I, if I've got the ability to buy property, like I'd rather buy in Rouse Hill than what I would in you know, Cairns, for example. Like I've never even been to Cairns, I own a half the place, but it's, um, I'm scared of aeroplanes, so I'm lucky I'm good on the boat. Um, but with that, it's purely just from a number side of things. So if there's an area that's been kicked in the guts uh, people have paid too much in the past, the market's collapsed, good upside for it to recover. Um, personally, I'm seeing that in the Gold Coast, I'm seeing it in Brisbane, I'm seeing it in lots of places in Queensland. Last year, Sydney saw that happen with the western suburbs, blue collar areas of Sydney as well. So, um, personally, I'd be looking more at maybe readjusting what you're purchasing and understanding what am I trying to achieve and how is this property going to get me there. So. Sorry? Quakers Hill, I don't think Quakers Hill's a bad area, but you know, I've bought in some of the worst areas in Australia. But um, with it, the, the purchase price here in the market there at the moment, there's a lot of first home buyers there, so they're pushing the prices up. Um, and you're just buying into a heap of market, I'd rather buy into a market that's, you know, would you buy a, a jumper in winter for two hundred dollars, or would you rather prefer it when it's got all the stickers on it for twenty bucks? It's the same thing. You just got to wait two months or three months for it to happen, and you wait another two or three months, you're paying two hundred bucks again. And it's maybe not the same with property, um, but while you know the, the, the market's hot, I, I wouldn't be buying specific things. And that, that would be in the most heated sort of market at the moment. If you had a bought two years ago, eighteen months ago, twelve months ago be drinking lots of pina coladas right now, but you know, it's um, buying it in the moment, buying it in the market at the moment, yeah, it doesn't jump out. Yet, so. I'll, I'll just go through the rest of these slides and I'll take some more questions and answers. Um, so the things that I think are the must of building a successful property portfolio is to make sure that you're purchasing in line with your goals. As we just discussed, it's probably the best example of what I could do with that first line there. Um, buy the right properties, make sure that each property is putting you in a better position. Make sure that you're buying below market value, 10, 20, 30%, the more that you can get below market value, the better. Uh, I don't like paying market value for, for anything. Um, make sure there's got room for capital growth and for the property to double. So if you're buying a property that's 20% below market value and it's going to double in the next 10 years, it's going to go up even further from building, having equity built in from day one. 
Uh, understanding your market and knowing your numbers. Now, uh, if you if you know your numbers, you can work around your numbers very well. It's just like the matrix. If you can see it nice and clearly, you can be the architect of your financial future. Um, and to ensure that you've got a strong cash flow, uh, I can't repeat that one more than enough. Uh, the reason being is that people buy properties and they go, oh yeah, it should be okay, I hope it can be okay. A lot of property investors buy two or three or four properties and they stop at that, and four properties is probably in the top 1% of the Australian population. Um, it's important that you've got enough cash flow. Each property that I buy for myself personally and for that of my clients, puts them in a better financial position so they can purchase the next one, purchase the next one, and go from there. So, how do I find the right deals? Um, I've spent the last decade networking with people, network real estate agents, um, getting out there enough so real estate agents will call me, not me having to call them. Um, find target areas. For me, when I first started property investing, I realised that I couldn't buy, you know, on my 18 year old wage, a property on the North Shore and all the beaches and all that sort of stuff. I bought within my means. I looked at areas that were inside with my budget and I looked at what was the upside for capital growth. And the reason why I liked Mount Druid, I'd never been there before, you know, my 18th birthday. I did actually, probably my 17th birthday, I hadn't been there. Um, the thing that I liked about that sort of area is the infrastructure that was being put in. The M7 wasn't there. You'd see all the arterial roads. Um, Wonderland got closed down, they're putting all the factories, all that sort of stuff. Over the last 10 years, people said I was going to go broke for buying a Mount Druid. And those people nowadays ask me, how can they become rich overnight? And there's no such thing as, you know, get rich quick, unless the definition of getting rich quick is five years, 10 years as a time frame. Um, is over the last 10 years, I feel that those sort of areas have gone from people that have been, you know, at the pub every day, on the dole, all that sort of stuff not being disrespectful to the area, but it has cleaned up a lot. Nowadays you see a lot of fluoro high vis outfits and all that sort of stuff um, out in the area. It's because it's a changing area, people are becoming more house proud, people have got higher earning capacity to be able to buy properties, push the value up. Um, as they uh, clean the properties up, you know, they're getting more money from them and higher rent. So um, I found target areas which worked in line with my goals to help me get there. Um, RP Data, I subscribe to RP Data. There's the same sort of tools that the banks use to value properties. Um, understanding infrastructure. And the last one is I took a conscious effort to do real estate sales training to understand how real estate agents position themselves, how they talk to you, and understand what they are looking for, understand what vendors and what other people selling the properties are looking for. And with doing that, you're understanding where they're coming from, so you can turn it back on them. If you can mirror the um, mirror the fact of how someone that you're negotiating with, you'll always be able to get a better outcome. So what do I mean by that? Is knowing how a real estate agent operates, knowing what they are trying to achieve. People think the real estate agent is trying to get more money out, but at the end of the day, they want a result. They want to be able to sell the property, move on, make money, go home, have the kids on the head, go to sleep, go out, do whatever they want. Um, they don't want to sit there and take 10 different people out and get an extra $5 for the owner because it's going to give them 20 cents from the commission. It's really um, understanding how you can present yourself as being the best buyer to the agent, being able to make a quick decision, fast decision, act with confidence. But you can't do that unless you have confidence in the decision that you make by doing a lot of research before then. So. I'm just going to throw this off with an offer. I'm not here to sell anything, but you know. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, um, my company, beinvestor.com.au, um, all my staff are ex clients. My business partner has over 50 properties himself, and he's up to about 70 at the moment. He was my client five years ago, and within the last five years, he's been able to build a property portfolio uh, that, if you sold it, had $5 million in his bank account. Um, all my staff, everywhere from a receptionist, has over 20 properties. Ex client met her less than two years ago. Um, if you'd like to book in a map session, just talk to me afterwards. I'll be outside. Um, I've got some forms. We can fill in. I can get my staff to give you a call and have a chat to you about getting started. You can ask them whatever sort of questions you've got. A map session, strategy session. Not selling anything from that. Um, 
did get advice from people, but you've always got to understand what's the hidden agenda to actually try and sell yourself if someone will give you a free this, free that, come to your house, someone's house is lucky to get 10 minutes to sit in front of me. The best uh, proposition is to be able to sit with people that are actually doing what they say they're going to do and what you're trying to achieve and pick their brains, ask the questions and go from there. So, if you want to find out more information, I make some pretty funny YouTube videos. Uh, if you haven't seen them, top on YouTube, top on Facebook, and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Um, the question that was asked is, what about capital gains when you sell a property? Um, and I look at that from a few different angles. Um, I am not a big fan of selling properties, so my property is structured in certain ways. I can't go into it to talk about it. It would be deemed as financial advice, that's why I can't. But I'll talk about it from my personal side of things. Um, I structure myself in different trust structures, company structures, to protect myself from asset, like, like asset protection. But not just that, the fact when you pass on, you can um, pass on your assets a lot of easier, simpler, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm planning, hopefully, for 50 years down the track, 60, 70 years down the track, yeah, um, to actually not have to sell the properties to be able to leave a legacy to my children, grandchildren, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but in a short note, though, if you made 100 grand a year, you have to pay tax at work for earning money. Uh, if you're uh, earning money from running a business, you're going to have to pay tax on that. Uh, if you're earning money by doing a property portfolio and selling it, you're going to have to pay tax on it. So, uh, in, in, from the other side, if you're going to make money, then you're going to have to pay tax. Like, the other day I was at my accountant's office working out how much money I want to pay tax on and looking through it all, and I'm thinking, every time it changes, like, I'm losing a Toyota Corolla here, I'm losing a, you know, I have to pay tax. And, you know, if I, if I sat there and said I don't want to pay tax, then I wouldn't be earning money. Something that's costed all the business. So, yeah. You got any other questions? Briefly. Briefly. Yeah. 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 So the question I was asked is how can I actually get the discounts to the level of what I was showing on the screen. Um, they, they come from a variety of different things. Uh, sometimes, people sometimes get scared of termites. Like, I love termites, they're the good negotiating friends. Like, they, they, you should carry a jar from around my car and come back in six months and get, get some money off. But um, on a serious note, um, different things, every situation is different. So what I always look for in any deal is a win-win outcome. And if something isn't a win-win outcome, I'll walk away from it. It doesn't matter if someone's going to lose and it's going to be unsustainable and it'll come back and haunt you. So with, with some of the ones that are heavily reduced in price, um, one of them there, I, I can't talk into a lot of the stuff again, and, you know, my mouth gets yep. shut because I've negotiated so cheap. One of them there, developer just wants to get out to be able to build more properties. So I was an actual uh, an answer to what he wanted to do. He can sit there and try and sell the units over time and over time, but I bought him bulk, give him a, a result, and so he can move on and make more money. Right, uh, right, right. Exactly. And and you just basically make a good offer. They take it, they don't walk away from another. That's it. That's it. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Numbers game. Add up, don't bother. 100%. Another question? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, the question was, is what sort of capital you need to get started um, in, in buying properties? Um, it's a good question. There's no right or wrong answer. Like, what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Like, I'll people say, I want to earn a half million dollars a year passive income, and might have, like, you know, 20 grand a year income now, so you've got to be realistic about what you're trying to achieve. But um, let me say that a lot of my greatest results of, of clients that I help out, I, I do it for fun. Like I really you know, I talk about my thumbs and say it in a funny way, like I, I help people for the sake of it, not because of any other reason. And the, 
clients that I help out are mainly uh, mum and dad's average income, 60, 80, 100 grand, household income under 200 grand, maybe some under 100 grand for the whole household income. Um, they might have a couple of kids, have a house, might have a couple of 100 grand in equity, 100 grand in equity, whatever the case may be, and they have 15, 20 sort of properties in two years, three years time frame. Um, if, if I take myself for an example, and I, I did make a lot of sacrifices in my youth and all that sort of stuff to commit to what I do, um, but I started off with 35 grand in capital, I bought my first property, worked two jobs, ploughed it all in the property. Um, I think that if you were to take a $50,000 capital deposit um, and maybe save 20 grand a year, 30 grand a year, you should be able to buy three to four properties a year for the next five years, be on 20 properties. Happy days, so not unrealistic. So, um, I think if you wanted to set an exact figure, now you could do it with 20,000, you could do it with 30,000, um, but I think 50 grand would be a good safe figure to start working. Um, it depends bank to bank as to what bank will lend you want. Um, it also depends on your employment status, or whether you're self-employed with the PAYG, how long you've been working, how long your business has been set up, etc. Um, it also depends on how well the says you one bank would say you can get 300 grand, one bank would say you can get 400 grand. It does vary. Um, it's important to have a good team around you and the right clients, people. Um, one of my companies in the finance, in the finance company, I've employed the best brokers that I can in the country to be able to understand investing and understand what banks do as far as lending. Um, so I can push in the right direction with them and have a chat with them. Um, from from a um, just one other point as well, if you walk into a bank and say to the bank, I want to uh, purchase a property. Um, this is my income, how much can you lend me? They might say, you can only borrow 400,000, 300,000, whatever the case may be. That is today that you can borrow that. What you've got to remember is that you look at the income, your current asset liability and asset position. As you buy more properties, if you buy properties that have got a strong cash flow to them, it'll actually increase your cash flow position and will increase your borrowing capacity. So with most properties that I've purchased myself, I've purchased for other people, the properties are put in a better financial position. So you might be able to borrow 300000 a day by the bank. You buy a new property for 200000 and rents for 300, 320, 350 bucks a week. The bank will then go, okay, 300, 350 bucks a week, 15, 17, 18 grand a year, extra income, put that towards in income. And they go, okay, now you can borrow another 300000 so forth. So. Any other questions? Tasmania, I heard it's a lovely place. I've never been there. Um, with Tasmania, I think, I'm not a fan, I've never invested there. Um, I'm sure it's lovely. I'm sure you know, it's not all the bad things that happen on TV and Chopper Reed was a nice guy and all that sort of stuff. But um, he wouldn't be able to put this mic on if it was Chopper Reed. No. <laughs> um, with it, I just don't see that there's enough infrastructure in place to be able to support a lot of capital growth. And it will naturally just go up over the years, but there's not enough uh, infrastructure personally to support my investing into the place. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Dubbo, what part of Dubbo? Where's Dubbo? I suppose probably for some clients out there the other week actually, in West Dubbo, um, where the old, the real bad mission was, they closed down and made an owner occupy. I forget the name of it, I, I don't know what it's called, but I know it really well. It used to look like something off a Stephen King movie when everyone had died and there was nothing there, when the place was all closed up, but um, I see it's changed a lot now. On the other side of town, um, if you're going out there on the left hand side of that mission, there's another mission area which is um, it's starting to clean up the apartment housing, starting to sell off some property. We just bought uh, some house there for eighty to one hundred thousand dollars for clients, rent on two hundred. Sorry? 
I think that could be it. It's on the left hand side, over heading out. Yeah. 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 Um, street names out there? Do you want to give me some of them too? No. But uh, we, I think we're talking about the same sort of place, yeah. What about Dubbo? Um, I, I personally, Dubbo is pretty far out. Uh, it's not like it has like a lot of uh, massive infrastructure plan to go in there right the, you know, like some areas that are, I don't like mining towns, I hate mining towns because they're speculative and over time they're, they're unsustainable to keep going up. Um, Dubbo, I think, will just keep going along. Um, they will uh, naturally, in the course of what's happened over the last six months, 12 months in the New South Wales market, will have some growth. There won't be any massive growth, but it'll just tick along and tick along. Um, after, after that, I, I personally don't think something's going to boom anytime soon. I just think it's bread butter sort of properties. If I could find something very cheap out there that's got a good cash flow, as I said, like 80 grand, $100,000 a house, and uh, rent of 200, 250 a week, um, I'd purchase it because it's going to clean up and it'll be worth 200 when the market, when that pocket's cleaned up and any sort of growth on top of that, again, is a bonus. I don't know. Out, outside my jurisdiction is commercial properties in Dubbo. But, yeah. um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I buy personally. I buy mainly residential properties. Um, of recent years, I do buy the occasional commercial shopping centre, strip shops, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Commercial property is pretty boring though too. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Fixed and variable interest rates. Um, good question. Um, I don't think interest rates, I reckon, are full of prognosticate over the course of this year. We may see one or two interest rates up, one or two interest rates down, like 40% basis, 25 basis points. Um, I don't think it's really going anywhere. I do note over the last week that. Um, Westpac has lowered its, or ANZ has lowered its fixed interest rates, um, and the banks are starting to lower the fixed interest rates. I think I can get 4.89 with ANZ for three years. That's pretty good. Um, one thing to always bear in mind when you fix the interest rates, if you have to break the fixed interest rates, what can happen is that you'll have to pay a penalty fee. And I've seen that happen to a lot of people. Um, a, a fixed interest rate, if you sell the property, you have to pay a break fee. You refinance probably pay break fee, those sorts of things. So they can affect that. But I think they're pretty cheap, and what you've got to watch out for is that if the interest rates are going to stay cheap for the next year at the same rate as what they are now, you can get a variable with a discount and similar sort of money. I personally, in an ideal world, you want to fix the interest rates as the market starts to rise, the interest rates are starting to go up, because we want to, if you're taking a year out of your fixed interest rate, while the market's low, you've got two years as it's rising, when it comes out of its fixed rates at its highest point, I'd rather fix it before, but I don't want to come out in a high rate. So, But basically paying a gamble with the bank anyway, because they've got a lot more money than all of us do, and um, they um, spend a lot in research and understanding their debt rates and all that sort of stuff that they're going to pay. So. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, um, the property, as you know, it's on the occupancy rates and all these properties. Yep, sure. If the occupancy drops, obviously your yield will drop. So 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. The question was, is do I factor in the, the, the fact of uh, occupancy rates? So if the property is vacant for a couple of weeks in a year, do I factor that into my cash flow? Um, when I analyse any deal, I always look at uh, expenses throughout the course of the year, whether that be council rates, ward rates, uh, new tenants, leasing a property, all those sorts of factors in place. So always, the fact that you could have property vacant for a couple of weeks, um, it might be vacant for a month, it might be vacant in two years for one day, I, I don't know, but um, I always factor in 
every expense that's thought possible, because uh, that's the only real way that you can fact and prognosticate into the future um, where your cash flow is going to be. So it's like forecasting for a business. I treat every property like it's a own little business entity, and how's it going to benefit? Yeah. Yeah. Window, yeah, yeah, up on the um, up in Lake Macquarie. Yeah. I've made millions of bucks out of um, house commission areas um, from buying ex, ex house, house commission. Um, I don't know if anyone here watched your current affair the other day, or so yeah, you saw it, yeah. Um, they tried to find someone that that's why they contacted me that, that actually um, you know bought lots of house commission stuff and I think there's a lot of money to be made out of house commission um, but it's it's important that you know you don't pay too much for it like if I was to go to Western Sydney auction today and uh, purchase a house you find everyone there trying to pay some stupid price for the house commission houses for the fun of it. Um, I used to go there and no one would be there. I'd walk in and go, yeah, bang, 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 take out a whole pile of stuff and walk off. But in the current market, it's not possible there. Um, Windale, I actually buy a fair bit of stuff around Bedford and those sort of areas up in the um, Hunter, or the, on the way up Hunter. Um, Toronto, bought a fair few in there. Um, it's important to understand the agents that are the active agent for selling to the Department of Fair Trading and getting on their database and being able to see what's coming up for auction. Look at previous sales of what's been selling and then make a decision then on what's good value and what's not because some people might look at an area and say this property is cheap. It might be a cheap property, but you need to make sure it's a below market value property. The difference between cheap, I can see my car that's broken, it's cracked, it's cheap, or I can give you a Ferrari that's cheap. It's, yeah. That's what we want to make sure of. But the, the, there's a lot of money to be made out of house condition property, so. Yeah. yeah. What was that, sorry? I'm going to walk over and. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. So the question was, is can you get below market value properties at auction or can you get it also at private treaty being for sale? Um, good question that you asked there. Um, I personally hate auctions um, because you never know what the result's gonna be. You can, I'm not saying auctions are bad. I think auctions are very good and make good money out of auctions. Uh, for me today, I don't have the time to go and waste by looking at a property, I don't even look at the properties that I buy, I just buy it based on the numbers. You don't go and look at Woolworths with the shares, why would you go and look at the property? You get some people to go out there, just do an inspection, make sure your checks are done, due diligence is sorted. Um, but when you go to a property, you invest the time, whether it's picking up the phone with the agent, whether it's finding out, giving the contract, whatever the case may be, you don't get it, and you do that 10 times. If you spend 10 test of building inspections on a property, and 500 bucks a pop, and you don't get the property, lost five, five grand just on doing research into a property. Um, I prefer proper treaty, but if it's an auction property, so be it as well. So I wouldn't be going to an auction property in a heated market, like a Sydney market at the moment, because you're paying more than what you expect. So. Any more questions or, yep. How do I, okay, good question. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. The question is, is how do I decide what properties do I keep for myself and what properties do I pass on to my clients from the investment firm side of things? And it's a good question. Uh, the reality is that I can't buy every property myself and look in every single one of my clients. Um, I only work with a small, limited number of clients to, like, I do it for fun. Um, I work with a small limit of number of clients uh, from a, a buyer's agency side of things. Um, each of those clients, I understand what their goals are, and there's a lot of trust and a lot of confidence and what we expect there from both sides. 
Um, so each property that I present to them is in line with the goals to help them achieve what they want to do. And from within saying that, the properties, a lot of times, the client said no about a property, and I've gone, well, I'll go buy it. Uh, a lot of times, I've just gone, here's a property, I'll buy, we might be a block of units or something, I'll buy one in there, you buy one in there, the next person buys one in there, we all buy them together. Um, the same sort of things that I buy, it's no preference over, I get the better one or whatever. I'm going to put it on YouTube, people are going to you know, feel ripped off if I buy something better than what they bought. It's the same sort of properties, I only buy the properties based on the numbers, I'm very open and keen about that. I think well, I'm, I think time's over for me, but I'll be up front if anyone wants to yeah, back to the side if anyone wants to have more of a chat. So, well ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together, let's hear it from Nathan Birch.